Hello, I'm Rev Brad, and you're listening to the Soccer Chaplains United podcast from the Touchline. During the month of August, we're going to be looking at some chaplain myths that are out there. These are comments, anecdotes, and myths that myself and other Soccer Chaplains United chaplains have competed up against from time to time, and I want to take a moment to address them. If you're a chaplain in sport or in soccer, or you've got an interest, this next series of pods might be just for you. And if you're in neither of those camps, well, you might be interested anyway to learn sometimes what a chaplain in sport, and especially in the sport of soccer, might be up against as we work and serve the people in the beautiful game. Well, we get the ball rolling right after this. He's found the space, and he's found the back of the net. Just a little off foot, thinking he's going to go far post. Not strong enough with his right hand. Whips that one in. Far post, almost made him in, and they have... He has the hat-trick, the second in his career, the third of the night, the hat-trick hero. Talked about you're not going to be able to sustain that kind of pressure. To the corner, goes towards the near post, and you're on the angle, and what a goal! What a goal! This week, chaplain myth number two. Let me set this up just a little bit differently. This is a myth that I often hear from coaches, team management, executives, or ownership. And the myth goes like this. If I allow a Christian chaplain, then I have to allow someone from all other religions. Well, many of you know that part of my work involves developing chaplains with other soccer teams. This often involves having a number of conversations around what chaplaincy is and what chaplaincy isn't. Trying to find out what is soccer chaplaincy really all about. So as Soccer Chaplains United speaks with key stakeholders around the nation and tries to sometimes introduce the concept of chaplaincy for their organization or team, this is probably the most common of myths that we come across in the development stage. Now, I say myth with quotation marks because really this is just a simple excuse, I think, that betrays maybe a level of naivety or perhaps a lack of understanding as to the true nature of chaplaincy, specifically a professionally oriented chaplaincy. Let's just put soccer aside for a moment. If we take a look at some of the other industries and institutions where chaplaincy exists, let's say healthcare or the military, not every chaplain in those places is a Christian. And I say too, there's not a chaplain that represents every religious faith group or tradition that exists. In a hospital, for example, you might have a chaplain team that rotates to care for different patients, and it's highly unlikely that even amongst that chaplain team, there's a representative of every religion. Similarly, in the military, as a chaplain, you're typically assigned to a unit of men and women And there's a diversity of belief and practice that is represented within that team. And usually you only have one chaplain and they may or may not be from that particular faith tradition, even of the majority of that unit. So how does it work for me? For myself as a Christian, my work as a chaplain in soccer means that for people of other faith traditions, I offer three main things. And I really offer these things regardless of anyone's religious affiliation. The first thing is this. I offer support, a listening presence, being attentive to express needs, whether those express needs are spiritual, emotional, social, physical, or otherwise, and also trying to understand the manner in which a person wants to observe or not observe their faith. Support also means connecting individuals to local resources that include places of worship and leaders of their particular religious tradition. You know, as an example, I'm a Christian chaplain, but we have many Catholic athletes and and staff and coaching members on the team. And there are particular ways in which they need to be served or they desire to be served differently than I'm able to serve them. And they might be better served by a priest or someone from their own Uh, their own tradition, even though we're within the same uh, banner or group of Christianity. Here's the second thing, advocacy. People sometimes just need a voice to speak up for them. Sometimes an athlete or staffer needs a religious accommodation from the club. And because soccer is a global game, 
Not everyone's aware of their rights or their responsibilities and privileges when it comes to their faith and when it comes to working and integrating those things here in the industry of football, of soccer. Thirdly, educating. Education. Now, this works both ways. Sometimes I'm educating the organization and sometimes I'm educating the person. I remember a moment when an athlete was trying to use their religious affiliation to get out of a commitment to the club to appear at a particular event or function. And in educating the club, I was able to share with the club it wasn't really unreasonable in their ask for the athlete to appear at a particular function. It wasn't going against their religion as they kind of put up that it was. And I explained to them and expressed to them, here are some things you need to be aware of, but really this doesn't go against their their faith or their tradition. Now, essentially, uh, l- let me sum it to this. If a chaplain is doing what a chaplain ought to do, professionally speaking, then there really isn't a need to have a chaplain representative of every faith tradition. Now, some might come back and say, well, why not just have a Muslim chaplain or an atheistic chaplain or some other religion? To this, I'd respond that a team or organization ought to know or understand where a majority of their people, the athletes, coaches, the staff, etc., where they align in regards to faith, faith history, uh, tradition, or we might even look around and, and say culturally, where, where, where do things kind of align, and seek to offer spiritual and religious support roles that, that match those things. Secondly, I'd argue this, chaplaincy originated out of the Christian tradition, and we've the longest history of service and care in the space. As an example, the Association of Muslim Chaplains, a professional group here in the U.S., was formed as recently as 2011. And I'd say that the Islamic and Jewish chaplaincy, professionally speaking, groups are perhaps the more developed professional groups amongst the three major monotheistic religions other than Christianity. And this leaves Christian chaplaincy much further along in terms of development. As a result, Christian chaplains are, in my humble opinion, usually better trained, better equipped, and offer a better level of care at times. Not not always and not for everyone, but for the most part. Well, perhaps you're an owner, an executive, or a coach, and, and you've heard this pod. You're listening. You're considering having a chaplain support you and your people. Did you know Soccer Chaplains United is interested to place chaplains at all levels of the game? So whether you're an elite professional team or a grassroots level youth club, we're open to engaging with those that are curious to explore chaplaincy for their soccer teams and organizations. Check out our website, soccerchaplainsunited.org. Click on our chaplaincy page. Learn more about us. Learn more about our process. There's even ways to reach out to us and start up the dialogue. I just want to encourage you, don't live with the lie and the myth. If I allow a Christian chaplain, then I have to allow all other religions. It's just not true. Especially if that chaplain is acting and serving professionally as a chaplain. Well, bye for now. This is Reb Brad coming to you from the Touchline.